I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. Sightings in and around Vermont. Bigfoot sightings across New England have been reported. Red glowing eyes, about seven feet tall. Red eyes, big old fangs, claws coming out through. Three inches long, you know, just sharp as they can be. There has been another UFO sighting flying over the Royal Botanic Gardens. There are 500 UFO sightings in the world every month. The truth is out there. We're back. We're back. Again. We've been having a lot of fun uh-huh. so far, I think. We got some good content in the in the can so far. We got some good content coming up. It's acceptable. It's acceptable. You would not believe it, how acceptable it is. You would not believe it. We should probably start thinking of something to do for, like, Halloween, right? Because we're in uh, the Halloween months. Mm -hmm. So, like, do we want to do, like, a special episode that we release on the 31st? Do we want to pull a friend who talks an awful lot about ghost stories in? Mm -hmm. What about on um, uh, uh, on Devil's Night when they say that, like, the spirit world is, is closer and that spirits can pass through. Maybe there's a story somewhere where, like, something really did come through one time, and um, and and we can try to find something like that. Yeah, I mean, we could do that, or we could we could delve into like a ghost story that has like a cryptid a cryptid lean, like there's like a zoological component to it, maybe. Uh-huh. Or we can go into like some kind of listener submissions or something oh, like that, yeah. like a special thing. I mean, yeah, if you like. I'll just put this out there and see what happens. If anyone's got any stories that they want to tell about cryptids for the Halloween episode, Mm -hmm. just add us and, or send us an email and we'll, we'll try to get back to you on that. And if we get enough of them, maybe we'll do an episode about it. Yeah. But anyways, I guess it's time to start the episode. Uh, Welcome to whatever happened to weekly world news, the show where every week we ask what happened to weekly world news? Is Bat Boy okay? What's happening in terms of apocalypse stuff? Has Sasquatch been having bearable tr- troubles with Elvis? You know, these are questions that, that have been lost to the ages with the loss of Weekly World News, right? Like, what? how am I going to get my fix for Elvis? I, I, I haven't seen a good apocalyptic doomsday prophecy in several years i don't remember when weekly world news went away i miss i miss those those covers at the local hannaford or supermarket right like don't you anyway i miss weekly world news so much i never even owned a copy of it what which is the weird thing i just remember viewing it Uh and always wondering what was inside Oh man, it right? was so good. Actually, funny story around the Weekly World News. Um, one of the reasons I got really super interested in cryptids, UFOs, and all that was because the Weekly World News always had like pictures on it. I was like, oh man, I bet you I could get like twenty bucks if I sent a picture of a UFO to them, and then I could. Use oh the- man, I'll never forget Bat Boy, the the screaming one. Uh huh. Yeah, it's kind of pretty much engraved into my brain. It was so good. I I think this episode, the 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 series though, might be pretty quick. Have a pretty quick conclusion. Uh-huh. Although we could just you know ignore the obvious answer, just like uh, other podcasts. So I'm fine with that. That's a thing. All right, cool. Um. Anyways, I'm John. I'm Brandon. We've got a pretty interesting cryptid this week for you. Oh, okay. A lot of people have heard of it. Uh huh. It was seen April twenty first. 1977 last seen april 22nd 1977 very specific dates kind of like the infield horror taxonomically it's a humanoid Uh uh-huh and it's in north america what what kind of creature do you think this might be Brandon? oh man um i i i don't know loosely how Uh how would you describe it loosely uh, like around three to four feet tall so it's a little bit on the, the the dwarfy side it's got no mo- nose, mouth, a watermelon-shaped head, some glowing eyes. Okay, so regionally, whereabouts would you say this is? This is this is in the United States. This is in the United States. It's in North America. We'll say Massachusetts because that's where it is. 
Okay, United States, 1977. We have Jimmy Carter. He's the president. Mm -hmm. We have Star Wars just came out, Star Wars. And we have Fleetwood Mac, I believe, was pretty popular at this time. Ooh, all right. I did like I did like Fleetwood Mac and Guardians of the Galaxy. There, that that use of that song was pretty phenomenal. I'm trying to think of something small that I've heard of that's humanoid in the United States, and I'm I'm having a hard time thinking of anything outside of maybe is is it something from Dutch or Dutch folklore? Maybe. No, this this is a it is it is a demon. If that'll help. Huh. Well, well, it's called a demon. Huh. It's the Dover Demon. It's the Dover Demon. I wonder where it's from. So it's it's a weird creature. So like I've described before, like kind of in this this bit that we do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's it's about like like a lot of reports put it around like three and a half feet tall. Uh-huh. No nose, no mouth, watermelon shaped head, and glowing orange okay. eyes. Some people have kind of described it looking kind of like a gray alien a little bit. Mm-hmm. So is this actually gray, or is that just something used to describe it? Uh, it's usually like a tannish or whitish color a lot of the time. Uh huh. Um, in most accounts of it, it it's a toddler with a pumpkin on its head. It kind of looks like a toddler with a pumpkin on its head, actually, because <laughs> it does have like a baby body with like really like long and spindly arms. Yeah. It's I have pictures of it. It's an actual demon. Yeah, it is, like, demon is a really good and apt descriptor for this creature. (laughs) It's a nightmare creature. Like, I don't know what it is, but I have this affinity for picking cryptids that are actual nightmares. Yeah, yeah, you do. I, there was one, one source that I found that had a picture of the rake. Uh Uh-huh. Or the, uh, the Louisiana, not the rake, the Louisiana, uh, zombie. Uh Uh-huh. Um, which is like that, that, like, trail cam thing. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, it's, it's basically like this baby with weird arms oh man so it's it's a little bit terrifying to say the least the least but it's also like in the Uh overall zeitgeist of Mm -hmm. uh cryptozoological thinking and stuff along those lines okay so like it's kind of like it's kind of like sasquatch nessie you know like it's it's like it's a popular one yeah yeah it's a it was so there's only actually been three sightings of it, which is the most wild thing. Only three sightings. Only three, but it's like it's like a B rank cryptid. I'd okay. Say. Like, like in, you know what I mean? So like yeah. Sasquatch and, and Nessie are what I would define as uh they're the, they're the A listers. Uh-huh. Then you get like Thunderbird, which is you know he's kind of like a a B plus cryptid, mm-hmm. you know, for because like not everyone knows about the Thunderbird, but anyone who has even a passing interest in cryptids know about the thunderbird mm-hmm. and then there's like your dover demons your skunk apes your loveland frogmen they're kind of like the b to c in that range okay right and then you got like like super hyper regional ones like the like i think it was a uh, I, I just saw it it's like the cumberland dragon or something like that Ooh, okay. there's like only one it's it, it's 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 one of those things when i started researching it i thought oh man it's called the dover demon uh-huh it's super duper sexy. <laughs> it's super duper well known in the the types of circles that I I roam in. Uh huh. There's gonna be a ton of data on it. There's gonna be a ton of discussion about it. Okay. Way less d- data and way less discussion about it, and way less like hard facts about it than I was expecting. Screw hard facts. That's fair. I mean, that's kind of the motto of Cryptopedia, isn't it? Screw hard facts. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> but before we dive into the the actual sightings, much like what we did with the the Enfield horror, let's let's dig a little bit into what Dover, Massachusetts is like. Okay. So Dover, Massachusetts uh-huh. is a suburb of Boston. I'd say it's a couple uh-huh. of miles out. Um, it's not like it's not like uh, it's kind of like how we're a suburb of of New York City. Gotcha. Right? So you're like sixty ish miles out. You know, mm-hmm. like. You can commute to the city. You can commute to Boston. So is this a suburb or is this more of a wooded area? It is actually heavily wooded. Okay. So it's it's like kind of a rural suburb. Uh-huh. Right? Um, kind of like we're a rural suburb gotcha. of New York City. It, that's the way I'm picturing it. It Actually, the 
the the description of Dover that I've seen mm-hmm. kind of remi- reminds me of where we went to high school a little bit. Okay. Even like the number of people who are at the high school. So there's about 5,000 people in the town. It's super affluent. Like the median income range was like 120k. Oh damn. Yeah. Yeah, Dover's pretty affluent. Um the high school Dover's pretty dope, man. <laughs> Yeah, that's fair. I mean, it's also, you know, it's a bit of a hike yeah. from where we are, but, you know, it's within the realm for a long distance deal. That's fair. I mean, it wouldn't go there on foot. That's a long hike, man. I mean... That's like a really long... You you, ha- you can't hike that far. Right. You need pretty good shoes. Well, no, you're not going to walk there. You drive. You said it was a hike. Okay, you you know what colloquialisms are. You know, you know idioms. Don't you do this to me. All right. But this is all very important to the story I'm about to tell. Because there are only like, you know, 400 to 500 people at the high school. Right? Okay, that's pretty small. That's that's not too big for yeah. a high school. It is a fairly small school. I mean, it, it, to put it in context, it kind of reminds, like, once again, it reminds me of our high school when we went to high school. Uh-huh. It's... We had, like, 200-ish people in our class. Yeah. So we, we were a slightly bigger high school than yeah. this. But it's important uh-huh. because it was one of those situations where if something happened, oh, everyone knew. Everybody. The next day. Immediately, everyone knew. Right away. It, it's not hard. And we went to high school before social media was even, like, really big. Yeah. And that's important in the context because uh-huh. all of our witnesses... High school students. Oh, man. Yeah. Um, I remember a high school, Brandon. He was sort of, uh, he was something. I remember high school, John. I would not be friends with high school, John. <laughs> high school's terrible. All right. Everyone, everyone who's listening to our podcast who's still in high school, I just want you to know high school is terrible. You're not crazy. That is when I got my first cell phone, though, and it was. Dope! It could open both portrait and landscape mode. It was awesome. Oh. Yeah, man. I actually think I remember that phone. I think it was the like a razor or something similar to that. Yeah, it was. It was like the upscaled version of it. Or something. what was it? Was it like? Uh huh. It wasn't the Sidekick. No, was it? No. Uh, I don't know. A- anywho, anyone who's been in high school will know that. Things travel fast, fast in a high school, especially a small high school. But let's get into it. Uh-huh. So April 21st, 1977, and I did do the research. Mm-hmm. This is after 420 was invented. Nice. Yeah, it is. It's nice. It's like, I think it's like four years, I think my research told me. So ah. nice. <laughs> About 1032 p.m. Uh, our story begins. Uh-huh. There's a group of three friends driving down uh, some some roads in Dover, Massachusetts. Okay. Um, they're all 17. Uh-huh. It's Bill Bartlett, oh. Mike Mazoka. Oh, it's Marvel all over again. Some Stan Lee shit, man. Yeah, it is. There's a lot of that. Actually, there's there's another point that I want to make. Uh-huh. All of the people who actually cited it, uh-huh. their last name begins with a B. Oh, it's a trap. Yeah, it's it's a weird... So it's like one of those weird synchronicities uh-huh. that happen in these stories. <laughs> I don't know. But I guess that's more because you're reading something that's like supernatural or out of the norm. You try to look for patterns. Uh-huh. So I'm not saying that, that because everyone's name begins with B, that means anything. It does. I'm saying that because everyone's name begins with B and I'm reading a story about a, do- a demon that yeah demons love alliteration it's fact you have to have three people with the name b who visit an area in a straight line (laughs) i mean maybe there's just not enough people with the last name beginning with b in the area now maybe you need to go there brandon i don't think i have enough spoons for that one that's fair that's fair Uh uh-huh i mean if you bring as long as you don't go with let's see uh well, as long as you don't go with a girl, you should be fine because <laughs> it's always the girl who la- who makes it last, right? Yeah. Usually in those situations. True. That's true. 
you have to not go with someone who doesn't want to go. Uh-huh. That's important too. Because if there's someone who didn't want to be there in the first place, they're almost definitely going to either A, make it to the end, or B, be the first to die. <laughs> Facts. That depends on the rest of the makeup of the structure. Yeah. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll definitely die if I went. <laughs> I'd be one of the, I'd be either the first or second to go, depending on the structure. You'd be the first. I'm shooting for third. Yeah, that's pretty much, that's the sweet spot, because usually if you're third to go, you get like the best death. Oh yeah, third's the best. Um, because like you know, the first death is always like a oh what this is real now. The second death is usually the second death is usually like oh this is not just a one off. And then the third death is where it gets real grisly. <laughs> That's the chunky one. I've seen the movies. I've watched Hellraiser. I know what's up. Yeah, third is where you want to be, man. Mm-hmm. And usually it's like the third death is the one that you really remember. That's the one that gets it good. Right? So that, and I feel like a good rule of thumb is just die later. Just as long as you can live. It's great. Just do your best to die later. It's a fantastic rule of thumb for life in general. Die later. Die later. That is, that is a cryptopedia uh, exclusive piece of advice. Die later. Anywho. So going over the witness list or the, the people who are in the, what I think is a Volkswagen Beagle Beetle because uh-huh yeah it makes sense because they they said Volkswagen and I don't think it's a van okay but I think Beetle matches the description mm-hmm. that they gave Bill Bartlett Mike Mazoka and Andy Brody 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 ah uh, I don't know about Brody yes yeah, Brody is a is one of those names that you start to question their motives so the group of teens is driving down the the road and. I found one article from Bill Bartlett from years later. Like he was like interviewing with someone. And he's like, yeah, uh, we weren't drinking, but we were probably looking to get drunk. Sure. Was effectively. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> when you're 17 in high school and it's the seventies, uh-huh. that that's probably a fair, like, this is what's going down. And we all know what's going down situation. That's what's going down. Um, so Basically, he's driving down a forested road uh-huh. um, about 35 to 40 miles an hour. Okay. is That's that's Bill's own account from like a re, an interview shortly after it, which sounds about right. I mean... That's reasonable. I would I would almost hazard that they would probably even almost be going faster than that, knowing how 17-year-olds drive. When, when was this? Uh, April 21st. Okay. Yeah, so... I, I, I'm totally buying their story so far. They're driving on, on what's called Farm Street, which is near Bridge Street, and on the way to Sherborne, <laughs> which was an important thing that was mentioned in the article because it gives you a context for where it is. But actually, the Farm Street context is extremely important because almost every sighting happens near Farm Street. Oh, damn. Okay. Yeah. So, so there is actually some locality to these sightings. Yeah, it seems like this thing might be somewhat territorial. Yeah, so there is there is a physical location, and supposedly three separate people saw it near that physical location. That makes it much more believable for yeah, me. Yeah, which makes which actually gives some cred- credence to the fact that they probably saw something. Because like like if if yeah if it's if everyone saw the same thing if it's all within like a couple of square mile uh-huh. area. That's reasonable because there is like, you know, territories that a creature will travel through. So apparently yeah, totally. as he's driving, Bartlett sees this creature standing on like this broken mm-hmm. down like stone fence, right? Like a stone wall? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like a a stone wall. Sorry, not a stone fence. Like a, a broken down stone wall. Okay. And we have a bunch of those around here. Yeah. It like turns his head and just like looks at him. As he's driving by. And he gives oh. the description that I gave at the, at the top of the episode. This like watermelon shaped head uh-huh. with a baby's body, some spindly arms, spindly fingertips, just kind of like chilling on this thing. And it's just kind of like, what are you doing, man? Why are you driving down my road? <laughs> and the eyes, they glow this like from the descriptions, almost like an iridescent orange, just piercing through the night, um, which... That sounds a lot more like I shine than glow. Yeah. I think it's I shine just based on the description. Um, it seems to make more sense than glowing. Cause there's like, 
with the exception of Scottish bulls. The Scottish bulls. Uh, there's no, there's not really any animals that have glowing. Makes eyes. it easier to farm. Um, and bioluminescence is a thing, but generally you're not going to get bioluminescence in your eyeballs because it's going to interfere with how much light you can take. Yeah, out. totally. There's no reason for bioluminescence in eyes, at least. So, it, the funny story uh-huh. to this. This is the funny part of the story, and the part of the story that makes it super credible yeah. to me, like, that this event happened in some way, shape, or form, and, like, he witnessed something, uh-huh. is they drive down the road, right? So they pass by it, they get within 10 feet mm-hmm. of it, Bill sees it, he's looking at yeah. it, he's like, holy oh, shit, what the fuck is that? They drive by yeah. it, and then he tur- like, you know, he turns to his friend, and he's like, did you guys see that? And they're like, what'd you see? He describes it. And they're like, no, we didn't see that. Turn around. Let's go find That's it. That's my guy. Yeah, Bill. That's the that's the most that's the like like his friends are like, let's 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 try go and find it. So they drive and they're like screaming, Come on out, get out of here, you know? <laughs> yeah, let's see it. Let's see it. Come on out, guys. <laughs> Which from my experience, uh huh, as having been a teenager at one point, that would that is a thing. Yeah, totally. That's a thing that happens. It lends a lot of it lends a lot of like street cred to this story for me. Yeah, it's like like even if he didn't necessarily see whatever the Dover demon is, uh-huh. I honestly believe that his recounting of the story, his account of the story, is reasonable for sure. Totally reasonable. Yeah. He also then said that like at a, a date like three weeks or something like down the line, he was with his girlfriend in a car Uh and uh, he heard like thuds on the roof. And he's like, Oh man, I don't know. It might've been the creature again too. What? uh, The stories that I've been covering, a lot of people then like, if they see something, they'll then turn around and account like another unrelated event to being related to it. Like, yeah. Like I feel like it, it kind of is like that, that old saying, you know, if you have a hammer, everything is a nail. Uh huh. Yeah. Totally. Except in this case, hey, you've got a weird, unexplained thing. Everything is that. Yeah. <laughs> so he did actually. So this guy is actually an artist. Oh, like is for the, real? Yeah, like he's like a real artist. Like he even to this day is a legit artist, and he actually does artwork. Yeah. Like he's a he's a fine artist. And his he like like at the time he was in the art guild and like the 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 police officers who were questioning him like yeah he's a credible witness like he's he's a uh-huh. legit guy and I'll believe that because you know in a town of five thousand people the the there's a higher than average chance of one of the cops knowing someone who's like deeply involved in like the artist guild or something like you know like there's a good chance and he actually drew a picture of it. One of the two oh. pictures we have okay. um, of the creature, which uh, in the, the the thing I linked you, yeah, um, there's a, yeah, I. It looks good. It looks like he could have used a uh, uh, like a Palomino Blackwing 602, which is a really good pencil, flat eraser, so it doesn't roll on an incline like a normal pencil would. I like the Blackwing Pearl, which is a softer lead. It can do darker lines. Did you just do an ad for a pencil? I did do an ad for a pencil. It also has the, 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 so the, the wood for the pencil is California cedar. It uses Japanese graphite and it is my preferred pencil. I do, I do a lot of hand drawing. I do a lot of drafting for a living and this I can't tell you enough about this pencil, John. It's it's almost too good. So, listeners, you don't know Brandon as well as I do. He was not paid for that. I know he wasn't paid for that. I know he just loves his pencils. I have my preferences. He does have his preferences. Expect them. Expect to hear more of them. But that's not where the story of the Dover Demon ends. No? No. There's actually another wit- there's actually another witness. Huh. Two hours later. Really? In the same area, supposedly. That makes it seem much more plausible to me. Yeah. It, like, the creature hangs around a specific area. Which is which is a, a more credible thing, right? It's way more believable than, like, oh, being seen in, you know, five counties, being seen five counties away or something uh-huh. like that. Which some, I have seen some stories where it's like, 
a really wild jump in sp- like space and time. Okay. So John Baxter is age fifteen. Fifteen, got it. Yeah, he uh, is he. If this is the same guy from before. No, this is a different one. So see another B. Oh, okay, yeah, another B, another B A actually. Oh man, which becomes a thing. He had been visiting his girlfriend that night, uh-huh. and he was walking down Miller Road, which in a the, a picture I have. Miller Road actually has a T intersection with with Farm Street, okay, which was the the street Bill Bart- Bartlett had seen the creature on. So mm-hmm. once again, like super reasonable. The, the, this description is like really like not too crazy to me, which I was expecting it to be. I was expecting it to be a little more like this is totally nonsense mm-hmm. because this this and this. But so far, with the description of it notwithstanding. Nothing about this seems particularly, like, off the rails. It's aberrant so far. The 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 physical description is aberrant, but its behavior is reasonable. It hasn't, it hasn't performed any supernatural feats, with the exception of the description of glowing eyes. But, you know, glowing eyes mean nothing to me with, in the context of a flashlight. It, it's just eye shine. Yeah. So after visiting his girlfriend, he was walking down this road, and he gets approached by a small figure in the dark. What are you buying? Yeah, what are you selling? Was it wearing a small trench coat? So, it did have a small trench coat, although John Baxter would lie and say it didn't. That's because he's full of shit. He can't be trusted. You can't believe a 15-year-old. That's a fact. That's a fact. He he basically is getting approached by it, and he like yells out to it, Hey, are you, like I think he said like MD or MJ or MG. It, it was a so at this point he just thinks it's one of his friends or someone he knows. Yeah, he was like I think he was calling out like a friend's name or something along those lines because I, I couldn't figure out what what he was calling out and it was it was weird. But he he calls out a friend's name or or something along those lines. Does it say anything back to him? It doesn't respond. Uh, but it runs away. Okay. So so. If the story ended here, I'd be like, oh, it was just some random person. Uh-huh, yeah. But because he's 15... Oh, no. John chases after it. No, John! What's it's... he doing? You can't just do that. He's a jerk. Imagine yeah. that. He, he thinks it's a person, and he's just chasing it. Yeah, he, he's chasing a short guy. Yeah. Basically. He's chasing He's chasing a dwarf through the woods. <laughs> I feel bad for the creature at this point. If you were just a guy walking down the road, if I was walking to the gas station, and someone called at me, and then just started chasing me, I'd run for it. This kid's being a jerk. I feel kind of bad for the creature at this point. I actually I actually feel really bad for the Dover Demon. Right? Because, like, you're just minding your own business. It's 12.30 a.m. Uh-huh. You're walking down a road. You just had, You just encountered this weird car. That just, you know, and you heard people screaming and whooping and ho- hollering. You're scared. Yeah. You're scared. And you're walking down this road because you're trying to find somewhere to go. Mm-hmm. And then this kid shows up and he's like, hey, are you so-and-so? And you're like, uh, I can't speak. I have no mouth. <laughs> I forgot about that. And you run away. Yeah, he's got no mouth. You run away, right? I'd run away. And then... And then this this fifteen year old asshole this guy. just starts chasing after you, <laughs> running through the woods. <laughs> like, I don't blame the I don't blame the Dover Demon. If anything, he has no chill whatsoever. This kid, no chill whatsoever. He is kind of a jerk to the Dover Demon. Yeah, and you don't be a jerk to things that have demon in the name. <laughs> Come on, no, that's just a fact. It's a Everyone fact. Everyone knows that. Although at the time he didn't, it wasn't called the Dover Demon. But okay. So after a short chase. He stops, and the, 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 the Dover demon is on the other side of a gulf, right? The base, like a big chasm or something? No, it's like kind of like a ravine, uh, is the description. The description to me, it sounded like a, a stream ravine, you uh-huh. know? Like the kind you get in those those rural suburban areas. Okay. We're both from a rural suburban area. I think we can yeah. both kind of picture what we're... Yeah. I, I think we both have a very vague idea of what he's talking about in his story. Mm-hmm. Totally. And so he's about 30 feet away from the thing, and he gets a... He just stands across from it for, like, several minutes. They're just standing there. Which is 
unheard of in these kinds of stories where something just stands around for several That's minutes. crazy. Yeah. Um, That's insane. Imagine if someone was just standing across from Bigfoot or something for, for a while. That's No one does that. Yeah. Yeah. It, that's actually... That makes it stand out quite a bit to me because it's so categorically different from a lot of cryptid and ghost and paranormal stories that I've seen. You'd expect them to just sort of run away and not just... Are they just observing each other? Or is, it, or is he... Are they just making eyes at each other? What are they doing? Yeah, it, and it's not the first time it's done it either because it did it on the road previously, right? And it's done it here as well. So it's, it's very interesting. So John's description is the creature body reminded him of a monkey, except for the head. <laughs> he described the head as being a dark figure eight. The creature's eyes were like these like two lighter spots on it, uh-huh. and they were about in the middle of the head. Oh, okay. And according to him, it was staring directly at him. Is this thing covered in hair? Because the monkey description... No. Okay, the monkey made me think that it was, it was covered in hair or something it, like it, that. In all accounts, it is, in fact, hairless. Okay. Um, Have you seen a picture of a hairless monkey? They're jacked! They are actually jacked. I have seen pictures of hairless monkeys. Don't mess with monkeys. That's, that's just a rule. That's just a rule. Don't mess with monkeys. Don't mess with gorillas. Do not mess with Monkey Davy Jones. Well, actually, you can mess with Monkey Davy Jones pretty easily. Um, just give him, uh, what, what was his, what was his poison? Bananas? It was like a leaf, banana leaves. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he, he's, he hits the sauce pretty hard. <laughs> he has a problem. So there's a joke that no one's gonna get. That was a weird campaign. It was good. I liked it. That was a, that was a pretty good campaign. It was good. It was good. It, I like how that campaign just ended because I ran out of ideas i had like i had this idea for like this wide overarching story and then i was just like yeah nah i think i'm just gonna end it and we're gonna we're gonna play curse of strahd now that's fair anywho uh so john actually stood there for several minutes like i said before just staring at it yeah he had he had like a stare down with the creature and then he's like wait this thing could attack me yeah it could it could. So eventually he backs off, runs away, <laughs> runs down the street, and gets picked up by a random car on Farm Road. What? Who Who just does that? You don't just get into a random car with a stranger whenever. Especially not at 1 a.m. <laughs> I forgot the time. Yeah. It's terrible. Like, I, I made a note in my notes that, man, the 70s are different. Because, man... The 70s were different. The 70s were way different, apparently. You can't just... He's walking alone in the woods, chases a guy. Yeah. And then he's getting into a car with just some rando that happened to be there. This this kid is like three seconds away from being a uh, uh, the subject of like a My Favorite Murder episode or last podcast on the left i wouldn't be surprised to see him on a netflix special at all this is crazy like, really i mean he wasn't luckily but like he was three steps away some of his decisions were not thought out and i'm not gonna blame him too much because he's a 15 year old uh, but man there were some questionable things he did in his story lots of them yeah but and here's the big but oh yeah uh, this is the second person who's capable of drawing Really? sees this creature. <laughs> yeah. So I've, I've added it in our, our shared Google Doc, and I'll okay. probably at some point start sharing these docs because that was a part of my plan. Uh-huh. Um, but there's a second picture that this kid drew, and it, it's it's actually pretty similar to the, the drawing that the first guy did. Okay. Um, the Once again, the, the fingers are very long. Uh-huh. The head's almost melon-shaped. The body's kind of baby shaped. It's got the spindly arms and legs, all that good stuff. Uh, yeah, he drew it pretty well. I mean, he's got he took a lot of time with mm-hmm. the background. He's got a decent tree, some rocks, some nice flowers. He did spell silhouette wrong, so I'd like to point that out. Oh yeah, he did. How about that? Although his handwriting's on point. 
his handwriting is pretty good, especially at that age. That's he did well. I don't write that clearly at twenty seven. So no, no, you don't. That is a good tree. I actually think he put a lot of effort into the scenery. Yeah. Um, I do respect him. Yeah. The the flowers are a nice touch. The rocks are well drawn. I like the fact mm-hmm. that he's got little pebbles. Honestly, as far as critiques of his artwork go, pretty decent. Pretty decent. Nightmare creature, but pretty decent. Yeah, his art's pretty good. Creature's horrifying. After that, there was uh, there was one final witness, and it was the next night. Oh, was this was this the same area? The same area. Okay. Around midnight. Okay, same time. And the witness was Abby Brabham. Abby Brabham? I don't know how to sell, say that name. Uh, Brabham? Eh, close enough. Brabham? Brabham? Yeah, Brabham. <laughs> it's kind of like Abraham, but like the words got mixed up, letters got mixed up in the word. And she was 15, once again, another 15-year-old. Okay. And she was driving in a car with her boyfriend, Will Taintor. <laughs> you know he got made fun of in school for that. He definitely got made fun of at school. He was 18. Sorry? He was 18. Uh, what? He was 18. Uh, it sounds a lot like you're saying he's 18, but maybe my headphones? He was 18. You, you, what? You can't just do, that, that's not, <sighs> it, it's, it seems like it's one of those freshmen dating a senior things, mm-hmm. which, if you're in, if you're in high school now, yeah, that's, it might seem cool, but once you get into college, it seems less cool. Once everyone's out of high school, everything changes. Mm-hmm. Just just remember that. Yeah. Uh, that's a that's a bit of advice to our younger listeners. Once you're out of high school, things start to change. But if you're in high school, keep it in high school as much as possible. Now that our scathing admonishment of that kind of relationship is done, uh-huh. let's get into the story of what happened. So around midnight that night, Abby and Will were driving, returning Abby to her home. Okay. And as they're crossing a, a bridge... Abby uh-huh. sees an ape-like creature sitting on the bridge, and this is her account. As I looked at it, it kind of looked a minute like an ape, and then I looked at the head, and the eyes were very big. It was a very weird head, and it had bright green eyes, and the eyes just glowed like they were l- looking exactly at me. So now the eyes are a different color than they were before, and that's a small detail, but it stands out a little bit to me. Eyes being a different color is not that big of a deal, because... If you look at like a, a a dog's eye and you take a flashlight and kind of do like multiple angles, depending on the refraction uh-huh. pattern, it, it can be a different color. And green to orange is not that crazy of a of a jump. Okay. Like I, I I had I've had German shepherds in the past and I've seen kind of orangish eyes on them. So once again, we're getting into eye shine. Eye shine is a huge deal to to cryptid sightings. I've noticed. And I almost feel like misidentification of eye shine might be the big part. That seems to be a big thing with a lot of these sightings, and they're two very different things in that eye shine is the reflection of light being generated, and eye glowing are the eyes generating their own light, whether mm. it be bioluminescent or otherwise. Yeah, because if it's if it's glowing, that's a huge thing. Because yeah. nothing like I have now if if I'm mistaken and mm. there is a creature out there that's eyes actually glow definitely add us because i do want to know about that yeah B- because that's one super interesting mm-hmm. like i've never heard of that that no. would be so cool to learn about and two it would give us a new tool in our tool chest for you know trying to make sense of these sightings because mm-hmm. then we can use that in our in our you know analysis of these things and our, our investigations and what we research and all that good stuff. So definitely add in this particular context, though, the only person who really got a good look at it was Abby and she was a passenger, which is actually kind of interesting. Cause you think about the first sighting, the passengers didn't see it, but the driver did. It, it's kind of interesting to me that there's like this weird dichotomy between the two sightings. And everyone who's seen this, they're all 15 or so. Uh, yeah, except for, Bill was the 17-year-old, so Bill was 17. Bill was 17. But I I also am kind of weirded out by the fact that there's so many kids out and about at midnight. 
Yeah, no, that's crazy. I would never, if I was 15, have been allowed to have been out that late alone or with al- friends only. Yeah, and most of these people are getting home like 1 a.m. <laughs> Except for uh, Bill and his friends. That was 1030. But still, still, that's that's the, but then again, 70s were a different time, man. The 70s were a different time, man. How do you think uh, there were so many, there were so many serial killers and murders and kidnappings and all that stuff? Because people were insane. It was crazy back then. That's why there were so many yeah. true crime podcasts and people getting killed and all of those shows about killers and all that on Netflix and all the true crime specials and dramas on TV. It was insane. Yeah. It's really, it's really stark. And like, sometimes I regret the fact that we're not doing true crime. Because there's just so many more stories because of the dumb things people do. But to close this particular account off, Will had actually heard of the, the sightings from the night before. Oh, I was worried about that. There's cross-contamination. Yeah, Abby apparently hadn't, but Will had. So he did ask her and didn't tell her about it, but at the same time, eh, that's there, there's a real dangerous, there's a real danger of like witness leading. Yeah. And like, like, you know, poisoning the, like, cause, cause your description, like when you ask someone something, it's like, did it look, so what did you see? Are you sure it didn't look like this Mm. or kind of like this? Or you like try to embellish it and you're, you don't think like, it's, it's one of those things you're not like consciously doing it. Yeah. But it's a real risk. I mean, it's, it's a well-studied thing. And especially in uh, the context of one Netflix Netflix documentary I've been watching, uh, American Vandal. Oh, I've heard about that documentary. I finished season one. I did not start season two yet. Yeah, it's a very good documentary. I recommend it highly. They do some very interesting investigations into who the turd burglar is. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Okay, I'm going to have to check that out now. Definitely. A hundred percent. Yeah, it's really good. I, I totally recommend it. Um, it, it. It's it's good. Do you hear something? Oh yeah, it's management. I think again, they're uh, uh, they're probably mad at me for my lack of enthusiasm last week. Yeah, they said something about that. I think they're trying to send us a message. All right. Well, I guess we got to go report in. Yeah. Today's sponsor is Anonavape. Anonavape is the world's first voice-altering vape juice. Just hit it. Blow cotton. And in seconds, your voice begins to change. Anonavape is made in California in an ISO-certified lab, and all their ingredients are independently tested and obtained from only the best United States-based suppliers. Trick your friends, surprise strangers, you'll be virtually unrecognizable on the phone. Effects begin to wear off after about 90 minutes. Now back to the show. The investigation of this. So, air quotes, investigation, yeah. Formal. Formal, yeah. Formal. (laughs) You know, formal. Yeah. It was actually performed by someone whose name i recognize really yeah so when i was doing the research for the enfield horror Uh uh-huh the researcher on that was a man by the name of lauren coleman oh okay yeah yeah he's actually he's a cryptozoologist who does a lot of research and uh before the episode i was talking to you about this guy a little bit yeah and he looks lucas-esque yeah he does look lucas-esque we 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 really need to do an episode about him alone because this guy has a like long and storied career. He's covered a lot of the heavy hitters of the cryptos- cryptozoological world in the last like you know half century of the 20th century. Uh huh. So I would really be interested to into doing a dive on him. So he's like a super prolific guy. I would love I would love to see if we could get in contact with him in the future just to talk to him about it. Because he's he's pretty interesting. He's he's led a life. It might be interesting. Oh, man. Yeah. No, he he's done Strange Universe. He's done Unsolved Mysteries. He's done In Search Of. He's done The Lost Tapes. 
Yeah. So I, I'd be I'd be super interesting. Like he did Factor Fake, Paranormal Files, Monster Quest, Weird Travels. He was he. Oh shit! The Secret Saturdays. Wow, he's he's done a lot of stuff. Like yeah. I hadn't actually looked at his Wikipedia page. This guy's done a lot of stuff. Like he's kind of not for nothing. This guy might be responsible for a not insignificant portion of my childhood. This guy's tangentially related to the creation of this podcast. Yeah, that's that's definitely the case. He was the kind of lead investigator along with uh, Ed Fogg and Walter, Walter Webb. Yeah. These guys are purely written by Stan Lee. Yep, so that's that's one more Marvel character for the the pile. <laughs> um, yeah. So reportedly, Lauren was actually the person who came up with the name Dover Demon. Oh, no shit. Really? Come on. That's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's pretty interesting. Um, uh, reportedly... There was no evidence found of hoaxing. A lack of evidence of hoaxing is not evidence of something being true. It's just a lack of evidence of something being fake. And those are two very important distinctions. At least that's the way I feel. And as you quoted on an earlier podcast, extraordinary claims do require extraordinary evidence. And that evidence is on those people trying to prove those extraordinary claims. Correct. And I think it's a spin on there being no evidence because let me get into some, a direct quote from Lauren Coleman, the short story, no pun intended pun was definitely intended. Pun was definitely intended. There's no way that that wasn't. intended. (laughs) It was totally intentional. Yes. Uh, Is that over a two day period in April, 1977, four people saw a small four foot tall, orange shark skin creature uh-huh. somewhat like Gollum in lord of the rings in three separate sightings in dover massachusetts a rural location near boston the case goes down as unexplainable i don't know the answer to what really happened as all white eyewitnesses checked out and we were found to, and were found to be credible by law enforcement and other people in dover okay so what he's saying is he doesn't think that they were lying which honestly Based on the stories that they told me, like what told me, the based on the stories I read, there is no evidence to indicate they're lying. I think that they legitimately believe they saw something. I think these people actually saw something as well. I th- also think that the fact that it's such a small town and that word travels quickly, that may have influenced someone who had seen something connecting dots that they may have not previously connected and drawing conclusions they have may not have previously drawn. Honestly, that's the main going theory I personally have. I, I really legitimately think that the core issue was this is a small town, even though it was Saturday that like, you know, it happened on Friday night and then into a Saturday, mm-hmm. that's still, it's still pretty quick for, for, you know, phone chains to start, people to talk at the general store or the, the local gas station or what have you. Yeah. You know, Lauren Coleman, he, he has this like theory of like weirdness magnets from what I've seen where like there's areas that are just weird, like weird stories crop up in legends. Um, are these like physical ge- geographically located uh, magnets or things in the ground that would attract monsters or cryptids or what have you? Or is this more of a cultural type of magnet where stories and folklore tend to be generated through the people or through the culture or through the sociopolitical uh, ideas at the moment? Uh, I honestly am not 100% sure what, his, what he's driving at. My indication is he... like I. Like in the particular context of this sh- this event, he's referring to the fact that Dover has a story of a devil on a horse. Okay. Which I didn't go into a lot of detail on because uh-huh. it's more spooky, ghosty than yeah uh, than cryptid, and it doesn't really add a whole heck of a lot. Mm-hmm. And also, there's a story of buried treasure in the area. Buried treasure. Yeah. So he's saying that like places like that have this kind of like weird magnetism for legends and uh-huh. folklore and stuff like that, which okay. socially, I think that actually might have merit. Oh, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, especially being in the Northeast, there's a lot of um, mm-hmm. folk tales and mythology and folklore 
that is based around the early settlers and colonists at the time coming from the Dutch and the French and, and what have you. It, it, yeah, there, there's a lot of history too. That's a big that's a big key part of it. Like we have such a huge amount of history in this area because we're we're largely from the same area as this this case. Like in in the the global scheme of things, it's next door. We do have a high tendency of like local folklore and local legends and like Legend of Sleepy Hollow. It was a book, but it's a part of local lore. Even though we we know for a fact it started as a book, it's still kind of like weirdly ingrained in local lore. There's just so much stuff in the area, and it's it's in a in the context of America, it's like the oldest place you can be. Let's get into some theories. Oh yeah, about this creature. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So in this case, I'm gonna start with the paranormal theories uh-huh. because they're good. Uh-huh. I like. I I think they're I think they're good. And I say good with a particular context. <laughs> yes. So uh, one of the sites that I got a lot of information from uh-huh. is this Pararational website. Okay. Um, and they have two core theories. The first is that it that the Dover Demon is either a lost alien or an alien scout. Oh, okay. Sure. Pararational. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So... I'm just gonna read their their paragraph word for word because this is this is great. Oh man! Um, it is conceivable that a UFO that landed in the area may have accidentally or intentionally left behind one of its occupants. <laughs> this could have been accidental or it could have been a scouting mission. The description of the Dover Demon is very much like that of a modified gray alien. Could the new could they could they have been testing a new scout species? <laughs> conceivable. I mean, it's conceivable. I guess maybe like it was conceived by whoever wrote that article, but not by anyone else. Yeah. Conceivable is not plausible at all by any stretch. (laughs) It is technically correct, though, because they did say it is conceivable. Not. Not plausible. Yes. Not that it is likely. Because it is not. No! <laughs> um, <sighs> yes. It, there is a lot more reasonable explanations for it than a lost alien. Yeah. <laughs> Particularly, like, almost anything else. Well, maybe not the second option. <laughs> oh, no. So, the second option on this... No, was, don't do this to me. The second option that they gave was that it was an interdimensional traveler. No, it's not! Who is this, John Tidor? <laughs> Oh, and I really man. Oh. It kind of is. So Oh man. I'm gonna read it word for word again. Just Please because don't. I really like their language and I could never <laughs> capture it properly. Another possible explanation is that the Dover the Dover It's not it's not possible. Another possible explanation is that the Dover Demon uh-huh. was a dimensional traveler. Sure. This could have been intentional or accidental. <laughs> In either case, the current theory no. is that there are an infinite number of universes, and the no. Dover Demon could have come from one of them, no. and either trapped in, uh, or either, and either traveled on or perished here. Its remains never found. Oh. <laughs> I, I like the fact that the current theory is that there are an infinite number of universes. Yes, but I feel like the current theory isn't that there's an infinite number of universes and things can travel between them. It's that there's an infinite number of probabilities. Therefore it is feasible to assume that based on our understanding of reality, the way that reality works might be different. Oh man. But the, hmm? so I'd, I'd like to interject yes. not to cut you off. But something that a lot of people lean on, especially when trying to do claims of UFOs, is something called the Drake Equation. And that is an equation that tries to calculate the probability of humans being the only beings in the universe. Now, when it was written, that statement was false. That human beings were more likely than not to be not alone in the universe. 
but there were a lot of TBDs and unknowns and variables within the Drake equation. And as time goes by, the those unknowns and variables change as we gather more information. And now it is more likely than not that human beings are alone in the universe, completely alone, more likely than not. So I would like to just get that information out there and for people who to like to lean on that to just be aware of that when they make their arguments. Yeah. Um, I think that's actually why a lot of alien theories have started to pivot towards interdimensional traveler. The final response to this is really great. In bold, they've written, that leaves us with the unexplained enigma of the Dover demon sightings. I mean, they're not totally wrong. That is actually not wrong. No. That is the most that is the most accurate thing in their assessment. Yeah. Because it is actually unexplained in the context of there's no in the context of the scientific unexplained. Uh-huh. Right? Yeah. We don't have a scientific answer for what the Dover demon is. Nope. Because we don't have evidence pointing to the towards the Dover demon. The current theory would be that it doesn't exist as it's been reported because there's no indication that a creature with no mouth or nose could survive. Devil's advocate, I think there are some sea creatures that do not have a mouth or nose and do survive. Maybe perhaps like a sea cucumber or something similar to that, maybe. Yeah, and I think uh, earthworms have particular behaviors as well, but I I'm talking in the context of a humanoid. That that's I think I think I should reframe rephrase that. There's no evidence that a humanoid with no mouth or nose or any orifices what to speak of could survive. Not to go on a tangent, but that reminds me of the scene in The Matrix where Neo's in the room and Agent Smith makes like his his mouth grows over and all his body parts start to fuse together. Mhm. Mm yeah, it's it's crazy. It's some body horror in a way like that you don't expect from a movie about uh, weird philosophy and misapplied critical thinking. Just because there's two crazy theories doesn't mean that there's not a handful of rational ones. According to them, it was it was rational. According to me, the first theory on this list actually makes some sense. So going back to the Lost Tapes, uh huh. So there was actually a Lost Tapes episode or sub segment about the Dover Demon. Oh, dope. Okay. Yeah, it was it was about two minutes. Um, uh -huh. I think I linked it in the. I'm gonna I'm gonna link it in the show notes because it's actually a pretty nice succinct uh, investigation of okay. the Dover Demon, and it yeah. has a few like legitimate experts. All right, so the the one idea from the Lost Tapes that uh -huh. really stood out to me is uh, proposed by Jessica Lynch. Alfaro, mm -hmm. she's a PhD in biological anthropology. The actual thing that discovers new creatures, she's an expert in it. Oh. So she's like, she's like actually what a cryptozoologist could be. And she's an additional person on the list of people I would love to talk to. Girls got grit, man. The fact that she's talked about cryptids already means she's open to, to have discussions about it. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I legitimately want to learn more about like how animals are discovered and things along those lines i think it would be really good to talk to her but that's an aside um, that would be amazing if we could uh collate any of our ideas on common themes that constantly crop up in these um in these findings that people report in the community for cryptid sightings that would be fantastic to present to someone like this yeah yeah, so, I mean, actually, on that note, if, if people are interested in that and they're listening to the podcast, definitely at us or at Cryptopedia, and we'll try to uh, make it happen. Oh, yeah. And make an episode for it, because if, if there's an interest for it, we'll definitely break format just to try and get a hold of someone who's, like, legitimately uh -huh. knows about this stuff. And if you have questions for that person, we'll give you some forewarning so we can, like, have some listener questions for them. But Jessica's uh, Dr. Dr. Alfaro, yeah. I should say, uh, her hypothesis is an exotic creature okay. known as the Slender Loris. Uh, and Brandon, I've linked it. Yeah, it, it's it's like a type of like uh, primate, I think. Yeah. And it, it's kind of like a the best way to describe it, you know, think of like a marmoset. It's adorable. 
it, it's it's kind of like a marmoset and that's a popular but that's like oh wow it's adorable it's totally adorable it's so cute man it's cute but it has little oh yeah no little beady red eyes that are i can see how people would be able to get that mixed up with something so basically the the deal with the slender loris is it's the lost exotic hypothesis kind of similar to the kangaroo from uh the from the end he field horror yeah so mm-hmm. we do have we do have an existing example where we kind of supported that type of hypothesis although based on wit- witness testimony i don't know if it's the exact best one but structurally it's similar to the description of the the dover demon my favorite hypothesis though is the is a moose calf a moose yeah because because it it matches pretty well because like think about it it like it has the long spindly legs it's got a baby-esque body it moves on all fours large head it they're kind of nocturnal so they'll have the eye shine it works pretty well Everything about the moose mm-hmm. and the moose calf, I see a picture of the moose calf right here, matches pretty well with the exception of two items, those being the fur, the Dover demon is not covered in fur, and the um, and the fingers, the really long fingers. In the picture, it's drawn gripping a tree. The moose calf doesn't really have those. Yeah, the, the only thing with the, the fingers... I. That's a hard one for me because I a part of me almost doesn't isn't fully on board with that because it was late when both of these all these sightings happened, and that's the thing that makes it most difficult for me, especially the one a.m. sighting or the the twelve thirty sighting. It, it's hard to say. Like it's tricky. We're dealing with eyewitness testimony, and this kind of goes into what what I talked about during the Enfield Horror episode, where you know at the end of the day you need evidence. You need physical evidence of a body. You need physical evidence. You need hard. You need hard evidence at the end of the day. So I think actually the fact is we don't know what the Dover Demon was, and I'm okay with saying that because good skeptical inquiry, good investigation is saying I don't know. We have hypothesis. We have a hypothesis kind of similar to how we have for the the Mongolian deathworm, right? It's like the Mongolian deathworm is. Almost definitely a snake, right? The the Dover demon, it's probably some kind of calf, either cow or moose. It or it might even be just that some people were out late at night, they thought they saw something, and it was something different than what they saw. And that's totally fine. And then it all got lumped together because it was three sightings uh, around the same time. You know what? We we don't have a perfect explanation. I don't think anyone was lying. I don't think it's a hoax. Nobody made anything off of it. I believe their stories. I just don't know if I believe the explanation that it's an extra-dimensional traveler. I, I find that the more research I do, the more I look into stuff, the more that I find, hey, that's just what happens sometimes. Okay, you can follow me on Instagram at donkey underscore hands. My website is boyerb.com. My email is brandon at cryptopediacast.com. And my Twitter is at crypto brandon, capital C, capital B. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at cryptopediacast. Our website is cryptopediacast.com. We have a SoundCloud, soundcloud.com slash cryptopedia podcast with a dash in between the two. Our email is cryptopediacast at gmail.com or us at cryptopediacast.com. There's also links to all these on our website, cryptopediacast.com. You can join the Facebook group if that's something you're interested in. Just search Cryptopediacast on Facebook and submit a request to join and we'll let you in. Additionally, if you can, just leave reviews for us on iTunes, Stitcher, whatever podcatcher you may have. It will be a great help to us. Make sure you subscribe as well if you enjoy the content we're doing because we're just trying to get more viewers, more ears on our podcast. And we'd love to give you as much content as we can. We're, we're working on improving it every single day. If you want to follow me, you can hit me up at Mew2057 on Instagram or at JF Dunham on Twitter. I also have a website, johndunhamgames.com, although currently it's redirecting to Cryptopedia. 
And if you want to email me, you can email me at john at cryptopediacast.com. Our art is done by Tom Hill. You can follow him on Instagram at thomasmichaelhill.com. His website is greatergloryco.com. His email is tommikehill at gmail.com. So I'm John. I'm Brandon. And things are going to get weird. thinking of maybe at some point doing like a, a follow-up on this episode and like visiting dover and just asking a few people like what's going on and you know what they thought about it yeah not not immediately but i thought it might be an interesting episode yeah totally yeah just as like a like if we could go there and talk to people outside of online articles who may have seen honestly it. i was thinking of like going to like the local library oh or, yeah yeah uh, the local gas stations and stuff like that and just talking to those people because yeah. those are the people who are going to tell you the most totally like yeah totally yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the the main problem with the way that we do our research uh-huh. uh is most of our research is done through the internet true yeah and because we do a lot of our research and investigation through the internet uh-huh. we're only getting the people who are already buying into the story yeah or the people who have gone out of their way to find out about it uh-huh. and the the cross section between people who are giving it its actual due and the people who are actually reporting on or investigating these things is not perfect. No, it's not. It's not great. And that's, that's the real problem with a lot of this, but you know, I think we got a good episode on that. one. Oh yeah, totally. I I think we got two good episodes. Yeah, man. (laughs) All right. I'm going to stop recording. All right. I'll see you later, man.